Hello and welcome to online Bible study today. Our texts for this coming Sunday, July 5th, are Matthew chapter 11, 16 through 19, and then a little later, chunk 25 through 30. Romans 7, 15 through 25a. When they put a letter on there, it means just the first part of that verse. So first part of verse 25 and Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. And um, those are for July 5th. I can't believe we are in July almost already here. So um, before we get into those texts, let's begin with prayer. Holy Lord, when we are weary, you call us to come home to you. One of the ways we come to you is by opening your word and spending time in your word. So speak to us now as we do that together. Restore and strengthen us. Settle our souls. Open our eyes, open our ears to hear you, to be grounded in you, to be strengthened for life and whatever you put before us. We pray in the name of the one who is the word made flesh. Amen. Well, our gospel passage to start with from Matthew 11, a uh, little context on that uh, to start before you read it. So if you're thinking, if you think back to the last few weeks of Bible study, we have been just kind of working our way through Matthew. We are in chapter 9, then chapter 10. Now we move into chapter 11. This is one of the things I like about the season of Pentecost that we're now in through the summer. Uh, we mostly make our way sequentially through one of the Gospels. This year it's Matthew. It's a nice way to uh, hear how there are certain themes, common threads in the way uh, each of the Gospels tells us about the life of Jesus. So over the summer, we can, summer and into the fall, we can be paying attention for what stands out in Matthew's Gospel. We don't ex exactly, when we work our way through, it's sequential. We'll go from, you know, moving forward in the chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's not necessarily verse by verse, line by line. There's chunks that we skip over or that we hear at other times during the church year and so we don't so it's not all verse by verse but we are pretty chronologically moving our way through so with that um oh actually having said that uh if you if you open your bible and you're looking at where we are in chapter 11 you can see we ended chapter 10 verses 40 to 42 last sunday and then the part that we skipped to get where we are today is actually about john the baptist and we read a good um, section of that in back in advent in this year so that takes us to picking up at verse 16 today so you can Read now, pause the video and read verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. And of course, nothing preventing you from reading the skipped over passages in between. So first impressions after reading that. My first impression after reading this gospel and, and taken out as a chunk like this is, huh? What exactly is going on here? There's a, there's a lot of things Jesus is saying coming from different directions. This is definitely a passage that I think um, we need Bible study for where we're sort of unpacking it together. So a few things in here. Uh, in verses 16 through 19, we'll look at that first section. Jesus talks about um, this current generation in his times, and he talks about how they criticize John the Baptist for being too austere, too strict in his ways. They criticize that, and then when Jesus comes and he's the opposite, and he's eating and drinking and fellowshipping with people, of course, people who are often considered bad company, but then Jesus is criticized for that. So Jesus is sort of making a point here that no matter the situation, people sort of reject and criticize uh, whoever comes with God's word. There's a question in the reflection questions um, asking if you think that is true of life today, that, you know, one way or the other, you're going to get criticized either way. Then did Jesus, in that, in that section, Jesus has, there's those words about the children in the marketplaces. We played the, you know, calling out to others. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. That's a confusing little section to me. I've read a lot of different comments on that. Um, you know, it appears to me, I picture the kids, you know, being in the streets and 
saying some kind of a nursery rhyme, you know, London Bridges or Ring Around the Rosie or something. But but what is Jack exactly is Jesus using that as a metaphor for? Um, some saying it the children are criticizing those who, their children who are playing, they're criticizing those who won't play, uh, sort of like John and Jesus, no matter what you do, can't get it right. I read another thing too, everybody gives different kind of explanations on this. Um, this person wrote that uh, the example is the those that refuse the invitation to dance and mourn are rejecting the freedom that comes from those forms of expression and they're fickle. They don't wanna dance, they don't wanna mourn, they don't find a home in either place. So I don't know if any of those exactly unpack that little section for me, um, but it seems that Jesus is building it to, to be an additional analogy to what he was saying before about no matter what he does, no matter what a prophet does in God's name, it seems like it's often not received. Then there's the section that we pass over, verses 20 to 25, uh, that's not part in our lectionary for today. But just a note on that, when we see the word woe, and you know we think of the woes, the blessings and the woes um, that, Jesus, that we hear from Jesus in actually Luke's version of the Beatitudes, um, although they're only called the Beatitudes in Matthew, but Luke's version of the same thing that has the woes. When we see that word woe, it doesn't mean a curse that Jesus is saying, I curse you cities of Bethsaida and Tyre and Sidon. Uh, it's more of a word that's a lament and a naming of a difficult reality. Uh, uh, oh dear, you people in the cities of Tyre or Sidon. Um, so, so I think that word woe, since it's not a familiar word to us, can sound kind of um, like Jesus is, is casting a curse. It's not that. It's a, a lament and a naming of a difficult reality. So as you read through that and hear it in that way. And then we get into our next part, verses 25 to 30. And here we just had these um, hard hitting, Jesus is expressing discouragement, frustration with this generation, with these cities. And now all of a sudden uh, the tone switches in verses 25 to 30. And Jesus is giving thanks, praise, gratitude to God for uh, wisdom that comes from God. And I love this understanding in our faith that wisdom comes from God and this idea that um, you can be wise in God, in God's wisdom, and it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your education level, it doesn't matter if you can even read or write. Our relationship with God, our salvation in God does not depend on any of those things. That's worth giving thanks and praise for. And then in verses 28 through 30, the very end of this whole passage, um, beautiful part of this passage, um, and doesn't need much unpacking. When Jesus says those words, I have to flip ahead the page here. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When I read that, I was drawing a little yoke in my notes there. Um, I was drawing the yoke, the kind that you see pictures of people wearing over their shoulders and carrying you know, two buckets of water or something. But then I was also reading a comment about how often animals carrying you know, really heavy loads would be yoked together. And what does that image bring to mind when we think of the burdens that we carry in life? What does it mean when Jesus is yoked together in those and carrying them with us? How does, how does that give us a perspective to walk through, walk in what feels too heavy to carry on our own? So, um, oh, I talked a lot about the gospel here. Okay, let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 7. You can go ahead and find that in your Bible. Um, Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome uh, contains a, a lot of Paul's theology, his understanding of Jesus. It's, it's understood to be a later letter of Paul's, so uh, a fullness of his thought, a maturity of his thought, all the things he's been writing to churches who um, knew Christian communities that are having struggles and are figuring out who they are. This, you know, a lot of that all coming together in Romans. So the passage that we hear today is a pretty well-known one, Romans 7, 15 through 25, 
A, I'm finding my place here. It's also a mouthful. If you're, when we pause here to read it, if you want to try to read it out loud, it, it's almost like a, a tongue twister, um, but you'll recognize the words in it. So go ahead and pause and read uh, 15 through 25 here in Romans. This sense of I, I know what I should do, but I don't do the things that I know I should do, and then I know um, what I should not do, and those are the things that I do. And the way that Paul says it here, I feel like it could read as our confession, our order of confession in worship. But this sense of um, that that very thing, doing the things we don't want to, not doing what we want to. Do you think Paul is being too hard because he's talking personally here using a personal I language here do you think he's being too hard on himself or does this resonate with um, the human condition and you know Martin Luther um, a lot of Martin Luther's understanding of faith and our salvation in Christ um, comes from Paul's writing and this passage we have today is very much uh, a part of Luther's understanding and our Lutheran understanding that we are both saint and sinner all at once um, and that always wrestling within us and I think that comes out very much here in this passage. So um, Zechariah. Zechariah 9, you can go ahead and turn there. Zechariah is at the, almost at the very end of the Old Testament, uh, the second to the last book, one of the little minor prophets. And Zechariah was one of the prophets writing in the time after the exile. So a, a lot of the prophets are writing about before exile or the people during the exile when Jerusalem had been overrun and conquered. Zechariah's writing in the time when people were just coming back into Jerusalem, except um, they came back and everything wasn't just back to normal and wonderful how it had once been. Um, they were trickling back into the city. They were still under a foreign rule and there was a lot of rebuilding to do. So uh, people were discouraged. Um, there's things in that that resonate with right now that, um, you know, there's no just light switch of going back to normal in these times that we are in right now. So I'm definitely reading that, hearing that in there as I read this. But go ahead and pause and read Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. Well, anything familiar in there? How about this one? Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We actually, um, in our Bible study, and I think it was online Bible study here for Palm Sunday, uh, talked about this passage, mentioned it, because in the passage we read in Palm Sunday from the Gospel, it talks about Jesus entering Jerusalem, um, not like a king on a war horse, triumphant and surrounded by spoils of the victory, but humble and riding on a donkey. And how even in Matthew, Matthew tells us that he was riding somehow on a colt and a donkey. And that comes from this Zechariah 9 passage and prophecy uh, where it talks about a victorious king coming in humbly on a donkey and then a donkey and a colt somehow. So um, there's a sense here of uh, this is meant to be a word of hope for the people Zechariah was writing to that um, a hope in a future king who is triumphant and yet humble and loving and serving of the people. So, of course, I ask the question that I always ask, um, why do we have this particular Old Testament passage with the gospel? And I think it's because of that um, sense of a, a humble king who comes to serve, and that's our understanding of God sending Jesus as um, Lord, God, King of all, and yet comes to humbly be among us and to serve and love us. And we see that in this image in Zechariah. And then that's also was in the gospel at the ending there where Jesus said those words, take your my, my yoke upon you for I am gentle and humble in heart. Last thing here, I love uh, this 
image, these, this phrase that we get at the end of Zechariah, or the end of our, our little section here in verse 12, where he calls, he addresses the people that he's talking to. He calls them, oh, prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope. What does that bring to mind to you? How does that feel to you? Paul talked about being slave to sin. Again, here's some of this both and, right? We're slave to sin and we're prisoners of hope at the same time. So may hope hold you fast in these times, in these times that we are in that are somewhat like what Zechariah talks about, where uh, we want to just be back to way, the way that things were. And Zechariah was encouraging the people, it's, it's going to be, um, it's not just going to happen all at once. And so may that hope that it's not going to be an instant, but that God, that Jesus is carrying the yoke with us and we move through the times that are difficult, uh, not alone. So may that hope hold you fast. Amen.